Hello, everyone, and welcome to Out of the System and Into the Workforce. My name is Jason Jones, and I'm a social worker here at the Community Technical Assistance Center of New York. We are so happy that you're able to join us for our latest offering within the Zero Degrees of Separation, the role of the Social Determinants series. Today's webinar will focus on employment and be presented by Len Statham of the New York Association of Psychiatric Rehabilitation Services. Before we get started, we would just like to go over a few logistics. If you have any questions or concerns, please utilize the chat box to the bottom right of your screen. All questions will be held for the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Also, we plan on showing a short video on slide five of the presentation, and if you're calling in, you will not be able to hear the audio. But there's no need to worry. We will review the content. Lastly, the presentation will be recorded, and all materials will be posted to our website. Thank you again for joining us, and now I'd like to invite Len to introduce himself and get us started. Len? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Len Statham, and I am with the New York Association of Psychiatric Rehabilitation Services. My role is the Director of Employment and Economic Self-Sufficiency Initiatives. I'm glad to be here with you this afternoon. And I want to tell you just a little bit about NIAPRS. NIAPRS is a statewide coalition of people who use and or uh, provide community mental health recovery services and supports. And we are dedicated to improving services and social conditions for people with psychiatric disabilities by promoting their recovery, rehabilitation, and rights. I'd like to start our time together with a very quick, short video, which is about 15 seconds, just to illustrate my first point. As you can see, no one grows up wanting to be poor and in the mental health system. There are millions of folks that did not grow up wanting to be in the mental health system or be poor, and yet that's where they find themselves. This is an opportunity for us. As you know, employment is one of the social determinants of health, and employment is a significant way that people can not only get out of poverty, but also start to feel better and move uh, into their recovery. I want to talk about the labor participation rate because we have a problem with uh, folks that have disabilities. And it's not the unemployment rate. You might have heard on a number of occasions that there are a great deal of people that, uh, with disabilities that are unemployed. According to the Office of Disability Employment, which is ODEP, which is a federal agency that tracks employment rates uh, for people with disabilities and the general population, 69.2 of the general population is involved in the labor force. That is, they have a job uh, and are currently looking People with disabilities, it is 20.4%. That is, uh, if you couple that with the number of, uh, with the unemployment rate for people with disabilities, is, which is actually only 11.1%, still alarming when it's compared with the general population, but nonetheless, our real problem is the lack of participation in the labor force. About 70% of people with, the, with disabilities are actually not in the labor force. So that poses a problem for us and for the many people that um, live in poverty and who have a disability. I say you can't win the game if you're not playing it. Over the last 40 years, New York State has not moved the needle on employment. 
when it comes to people with disabilities. And a large degree is because we haven't had people in the labor force. So I'm going to talk to you today about how to move people into the labor force, how to begin conversations with people that you're seeing every day about employment and the importance of it as it plays out in a person's recovery. So what we need to do is we need to have some different conversations and we need to use some different tools. And I'm going to show you a couple of tools that I prefer to use that I've had much success with, but we also need to have different conversations because the conversations that we're having have not led to people kind of raising their hand and saying, I, I want to work. Now, you all know, um, hopefully, know that there is an evidence-based practice when it comes to helping people with disabilities find work, and that is IPS, Individual Placement and Support, which is a great model, and it works. Approximately 40% of people that enter into an IPS program get jobs and are able to sustain those jobs which is fantastic for the people that raise their hand and say they would like employment. The problem is we have a great number of people that are not raising their hand and saying, I would like employment. And so let's talk about why people perhaps are not saying employment is for them. Activation. So think about what happens when you're inactive. And I'm talking about someone who may be physically inactive for a while. What happens to people? It's hard to get started because you haven't been, act you haven't been active for a while. There is a sense of inertia that sets in physically for you. And it's no different for people that have been out of the workforce for a while. And sometimes we take that as some people just not being motivated when, in fact, they just haven't been active. Again, the comparison is one with someone who has been physically inactive. So how do we get people activated? There are certain things that you might do to activate you that might not work for others. So it's really about finding out what activates the people that you're currently working with. I've developed a couple of tools that have been helpful in helping to bring about conversations with people about employment and in different ways. I know that we've, for a long time, we've had conversations with people about how great work is. And I'm the first person to talk about how great work is. It does provide a sense of purpose. It does provide uh, more income. It does provide uh, more social relationships. However, when you're talking to people that perhaps have not experienced that in their labor force participation, it falls on deaf ears. In other words, if their own history illustrates to them that work was not good for them, that they perhaps got sick at work, that they didn't experience good things at work, perhaps they experienced stigma, then when we're talking to them about how great work is, there's no context within them to receive the information we're talking about. And so that particular method, while it seems right and it seems like it would work, oftentimes does not. And so I would like to propose the following tool. Talking with people from a place that they understand. And we know that the conditions of poverty can cause certain mental health disorders and that alleviating poverty can have positive effects on adults and children's mental health. That was some research that was done by Costello in 2003. So employment works for people that are experiencing poverty. We really don't even need this particular research because back in 2009, uh, when we were experiencing a recession, um, I, I saw a lot of articles that suggested that people that were of the general population were having to go on unemployment 
and they were living on half their income. And some of those people actually could not find work and then had to leave unemployment and had to go on some kind of social service uh, subsidy. And they examined a large cohort of those folks from the general population and found that these folks began to develop certain mental health disorders. Everything from anxiety to depression to uh, bipolar illness, even some further diagnoses such as schizophrenia, they found of the general population that just because of the impact of poverty, they began to develop mental health symptoms. Now, that is bad news. But the good news is that employment is one of the answers to helping people get better. This is an activation tool that I developed mainly out of frustration. I didn't mention in the beginning, but prior to me joining NIAPERS, I worked in a PROS program, Personalized Recovery Oriented Service. And that PROS program is located here in Rochester, New York, where I'm from. And I taught a benefits class there on, on, on a regular basis. And let me tell you, I am a certified benefits planner. I know my work incentives inside and out, both Social Security um, and um, SSI and Medicaid and Medicare and social services. I've been trained to help people with their benefits. And yet, in this class, as I was going over a great myriad of work incentives, I really wasn't seeing that translate into people saying, hey, I think I'd like to work. It wasn't translating into people raising their hand and saying, yeah, I think I can do this. And so I got frustrated one day and I said, I've got to do something different. And so I came up with this tool. And as you can tell, I've ripped off a MasterCard commercial. I'm sure you all know the MasterCard commercial, the one where there's a family crawling on the beach and the narrator comes on and says, well, this uh, cost of this vacation was $4,000, but time spent with family is priceless. And so I used this ad and I placed it on the board of the room in which I was teaching. And when I got to class, the class knew something was up because I usually would work out of a work incentive book. And I walked into the class and I said to the entire class, it is okay if you decide that employment is not for you. Now, they were a little taken back by that because, as I said, I'm kind of a rah-rah guy when it comes to employment. And so they knew immediately something was up. And then I directed their attention to the board, which had this tool on it. And I said to the class, if you decide that employment is not for you, again, we're person-centered here. That's fine with me no money out of my wallet, it's a personal choice. But if that personal choice continues and you decide that not only today, but tomorrow and the next and throughout your lifetime, if you don't want to experience employment again, then I'm going to make a guarantee. I am going to guarantee that you will be poor forever because benefits equal poverty. Now, some of you might think, wow, that is kind of harsh. It wasn't harsh, but it was a true statement that people hadn't thought about. Now, it's not that people didn't know they were poor. They knew they were poor. They were trying to make that food stamp last until the end of the month. They were going to appointments to keep their benefits. They knew they were poor. But they hadn't really thought about 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years down the road being in the exact same position that they are in on that very day. 
And let me say, it was alarming to people. Some people first didn't believe it. And I said, well, you're living on $808, which is the standard SSI amount. And if you remain only on benefits, that will only go up very incrementally over the next 30 years. And so the position you find yourself in today, you'll find yourself in that position 30 years from now. And what that did was create a, a, almost a portal for people to see what their life was going to look like in 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road. And people did not like that. Now, if you're familiar with psych rehab, you know that an important ingredient in helping people to make change is the level of dissatisfaction that they have. And what this tool did was open people's eyes, again, 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and see, wait a minute, I'm not going to be very satisfied with where I'm going to end up. And it opened up that portal for them to see and actually not be too happy about where they were going to be. And so we had a conversation that day, and the conversation was entirely about benefits equal poverty. We actually never got past that. We never got to the benefits plus employment equal working poor or the employment minus benefits being priceless because people wanted to talk about that. And let me tell you, we did have a gentleman in class that raised his hand high and said, I am proud to be on SSI because it keeps me humble. And I said, that's fantastic. That is a great value to have. I wouldn't be doing anybody a favor by trying to persuade them to drop a value like that. I said, I think I might be able to have that value and make a little more money, but if you figure you can't, then who am I to judge you? And so I left it at that. I did see him after class, and I knew a couple of things about him. I knew that his fiance attended our program and that she was pregnant. And so I started some small talk with him after class, and we began talking about the fact that he was going to be a father very soon. And I asked them had they picked out a name for the child, it was going to be a girl. They hadn't picked out a name yet. And I said, wow, you know, in three months, your life is going to change dramatically. Have you thought about what life's going to be like as a dad? And we continued the conversation, and we got on the, the theme of what dreams do you have for your daughter? And he jokingly said to me, well, wouldn't that be funny if she turned out to be a psychiatrist? She could prescribe my meds for me. And I said, well, I guess so. But I saw my opening. And so I asked him, I said, well, you know, what if she comes to you at, I don't know, 14 or 15 and says to you, Dad, I know what I want to do when I grow up. I want to be on SSI because it's going to keep me humble. I asked him, what would you think about that? And he said, I would be very, very disappointed. And I said, I'm a little confused because you mentioned in class about 15 minutes ago that for you it would be okay. But now you're telling me that it wouldn't be okay for your daughter. So I'm wondering if you might be able to, to tell me a little bit more about that. Well, by that time, you had to get to another class conveniently. And uh, we did not have a chance to continue the converse, conversation then. And in fact, he didn't show up for three or four days. I was worried. I thought I had uh, talked them um, out of even coming to Pearl. But he did come back, and he made a beeline for me. And he said, look it, I just want you to know that it does keep me humble. I said, I never argued, you, argued with you about it. He said, yeah, yeah, I know. I just want you to know that. And I also want you to know I'm very scared about going back to work. I've worked one time in my life. I'm only 25. The time that I worked, I got sick. I lost my job. I lost my way of life. I lost friends. I lost family members. 
and I lost a great deal of money. And I never, ever want to experience anything remotely close to that. And I said to him, you know, I don't blame you. I don't blame you for not wanting to explore the employment world again. It must be very frightening to you. And he said, of course, it is. And I said, if you would do me the honor of helping me to find a position that would be best for you, that you and I would work together, we would walk this journey towards employment together, you're not in the same position you were five years ago when you got sick. You've got some tools that you've developed here at PROS. But I think there's a place for you outside in the employment world. You have too much to offer. He was very skilled at uh, IT kinds of things. He, he, takes, he was always bringing me in computers he had built. And so I said, this guy's got some talent. And I said to him, let's find something that you're good at and work from there. And so we were able to find him a job. It took about three months, which is not long um, because he had those skills. I got him a job at uh, Paychex, which is a payroll company, national payroll company here in Rochester, New York. And he got to work. And it was a perfect job for him because he was troubleshooting with people on the phone with, the, with their payroll system. And he enjoyed it very much. It was a part-time job. And uh, by the time I left the post program, he was actually making more than me and uh, letting me know it, which was, uh, which was quite funny. Um, funny to him, maybe. Um, but it was really um, a, a case where he just needed a very gentle push, an activation that would help him move into experiencing employment in a different way. I would recommend this tool to anyone. I, you can use it in a class or you could use it individually, which I began to do after, um, after that particular class was so successful. And many people that day made a beeline to me to start working on a plan because they just didn't know or didn't like um, where they were at. It. And I think one of the things that we often don't think about, uh, about explaining to people is when people accept benefits, and I'm all for, uh, for people receiving benefits, but when they accept benefits, there's a price to be paid, and that price is a person's freedom. Someone who is economically self-sufficient has much greater freedom. They are not uh, uh, having to go to um, different appointments. Uh, they're not having to prove that they're disabled or, or not disabled. Um, they have the means to decide, hey, I'm going to go on vacation this year. Or they have the means to go out to dinner. I'm just going to decide to go out to dinner. They also can choose the neighborhoods that they live in for the most part. Um, I'm economically self-sufficient, and while I can't live in the Hamptons, I can choose a place that is relatively crime-free, um, also not having to deal with a, a landlord that is not uh, making repairs. I have that freedom. When you choose, uh, to receive those benefits, you lose freedom. Those are choices, uh, some of those choices you no longer have. The next tool is something you're probably all familiar with, which is the eight domains of wellness. I love this product of SAMHSA that was created by Peggy Swarbrick because these eight domains of wellness, every single one of these domains, the financial, the emotional, the physical, spiritual, environmental, meaning kind of like where you live, intellectual, social, and occupational, all of these domains are impacted by poverty, which mean all of these domains are impacted by employment. Now, it's very easy if someone is experiencing financial difficulty to bring up employment. If someone's not making enough money, well, the answer to that is usually employment or self-employment or not spending as much as they are. Even physically, um, we know that people that are working 
generally tend to be more physically fit. They can afford gyms. Uh, they can afford foods that are more nutritious. If you are living in poverty and if you are in a city someplace, you usually are getting your food at the corner store, which has nothing, uh, nothing but junk food, not a lot of vegetables. And so even a, the, the domain of well, physical wellness is impacted by poverty. But let's take something like environmental. As I made the point earlier, a person that is only living on $808 a month, which is your SSI amount, and it's less for people on social services, so you're, you're even further limited. Employment would help someone who's experiencing problems with their house, whether they are living in a dilapidated, dilapidated apartment and they don't like uh, the condition of their apartment, or they're living in a crime-free or crime-ridden um, area. Employment is actually a tool that can help people move toward their goal of housing. Even a social goal and funds can be used as a means to help people find um, social services. I'll give you a great example. I was working with a, a gentleman at our pros program who was uh, looking for a girlfriend, and that was his goal. That's the goal that he presented. And I said, great. This is a fine goal. It's just because a person is disabled doesn't mean that they don't want a life partner. And so we began to work on the goal of getting a girlfriend. And he uh, began to ask me lots of questions. He, uh, he said, well, you know, how did you, uh, how did you talk to your um, wife? I said, well, first of all, I met her at uh, work. I took out a, a picture of her and, and showed him the picture. And he said, God, how did you how did you woo her? And I said, Wow, uh, <laughs> I wasn't insulted, but I was taken back. And I said, Well, I know she's better looking than me, but this is how I wooed her. I took her out to dinner. I um, went out on dates with her. We went out for coffee together. We went to shows together. I bought her shoes. Big mistake. That's uh, one that I'm still paying for. But those are things that we did just to get to know one another and enjoy each other's company. And during this conversation, his mood actually lowered. And he finally got to the point where he was just looking so dejected, I had to check in with him. And I said, look, it, you know, I'm not sure what's going on. Can, can you tell me what's going on? And I'll never forget what he said. He said, I can't afford a girlfriend. And I said, you know what? I think you're right. And I think the way that we're going to get your girlfriend is through employment. What do you say? And he still wasn't convinced. So I had to really get down the brass tacks with him. And I said to him, women will find you more attractive if you're working. It's just a perceptual reality. People date and like to date people that have jobs whether it's a male or a female, it's important. It's a status. And so we finally said, okay, let's try this thing. I got him a job. It took me about four months, but I got him a job. I got him a job at Wegmans, which is a grocery store, world's greatest grocery store, um, that's in Rochester and upstate New York, um, soon coming to Brooklyn. And he worked there for about three months, and I didn't see him. Because as part of our pros model, once a person gets a job, they go on to an ongoing rehab support, which was not in my area. But three months later, he comes back to me and he says, hey, I just want you to know, I worked with you for four months to get a job. I then had been working for three months to, get, uh, to, to do this job, and I still don't have a girlfriend. I was taken quite back. I really didn't know what to say. I was sort of stumbling with my words. And I finally said to him, well, how do you like the money that you're getting? He said, I love the money that I'm getting. I'm saving some of my money. I said, well, what else are you doing? He said, well, I'm going out for you know, dinner. I'm going out for coffee, but I'm doing all these things by myself. I said, okay, okay. But look at I said, you are working in 
Walmart or I mean Wegmans. Wegmans is the is the it's the busiest Wegmans that we have in Rochester, New York. Thousands of people go through that door every day. Not to mention the huge amount of people that are continually being onboarded there. You're going to need somebody. And sure enough, two months later, he comes back to me. And he says to me, hey, I want you, I want you to know I, I do have a girlfriend. I said, really? Where did you meet her? They said, yeah, yeah, I met her at work. Fantastic. Here was this lonely guy. He'd been in the mental health system, mental health system for years. And as a result of a social goal, one that you wouldn't think, well, not the employment really doesn't factor in here, but because we factored employment as an objective to getting to that goal, he not only got employed, but he accomplished his social goal. And today is no longer in the mental health system. He goes every three months for his uh, meds, but that's it. His life is not in the mental health system. You see, employment takes people out of the system and gives them new meaningful, robust lives like the ones they dream about when they're kids. And so these eight domains of wellness, I would say if you are familiar with it, if you've got it uh, on your wall, take it off the wall. Use it as a tool to help people discover employment. Use it as a tool to use employment as a means to help people in any one of these eight domains. You'll be glad you did. It's a really great tool to be used in that fashion. I'd like to tell people about the concept of fact telling and story selling. And it's a sales idea that was told to me by a sales friend of mine who's highly successful in the sales arena. And this is another strategy to employ because I believe that no one can sell employment better than someone who has experienced difficulties uh, with their mental health and who are working. This gentleman friend of mine he and I were talking one day, and he said, hey, you know, my sales philosophy is pretty simple, and that is that, uh, you know, facts tell and stories sell. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. Why don't you text it to me because I'll forget it. And I'd like to think about it. And as I began to think about it, I began to think, wow, that's, that's really a true statement because we have all sorts of facts in terms of work incentives, and just presenting those facts is not enough. Yes, the number one reason why people don't return to work is because they're fearful of losing their benefits, but presenting them only with the facts does not sell them on employment. I learned that through my years at Pros. But stories, now stories, those are the selling, selling points. And so, facts and stories together of people that have made it, that have made a conscious decision to seek out employment after they uh, have experienced a mental illness, those are stories that sell. And I want to make mention of, of the fact that, uh, and you'll see in the resource section, Niapers has a great uh, video of 10 individuals that tell their story of how they actually were able to successfully move from poverty and from symptoms, pretty severe symptoms, to employment and being successful at employment. It's simply a free download. And one of the things I like about the video is that it really takes into account everyone who lives in New York State. So you have some people from downstate. You have people from the Rochester and Buffalo area. You have people from the southern tier. And you have people from the um, north 
uh, north of uh, the uh, near the Adirondacks that are covered. And they all tell their story. There are people on the video that uh, were so destitute that they were living in their car, some couldn't get out of bed, and yet they're telling their stories about how they overcame that and are now working. And let me tell you, I showed this video prior to me coming to Niapers because it came out just a little bit before I joined. And many people were motivated and get, gained encouragement and hope from seeing people that made it, that were able to tell their stories about what they went through and how they got through it. And that's the case with this woman that you see here before you. This was a woman that attended our PROS program. She was a highly visible person in our PROS community. Uh, number one, people just thought the world of her. She was a great person. And as I said, she was highly visible. She was highly visible because once a month, she had to go to the hospital because she started hearing voices. And she would say, please call an ambulance because I don't like what these voices are telling me to do. And we would oblige her and call the ambulance. And the ambulance would come into our PROS program along with the stretcher, take her, and bring her to the local hospital. And I said to my staff, I said, I want to see her working. Now the staff thought, well, I guess it's possible, but what are you going to do when she needs to go to the hospital every month? And I said, well, I don't sweat the details. Let's just get her a job. And I had a conversation with her about employment. And she said, well, you know, I'm not really wanting employment. I said, well, why don't you help me um, in our cafe? We had a little cafe that we ran in our pros program. And it was a uh, just a coffee place with some products that we sold. And she said, yes, I'd be more than willing to help you out. And so I taught her how to use the cash register, and um, she greeted people, and she um, she um, was also uh, doing some of the cleaning for us, and she was experiencing success at that volunteer uh, position that she uh, she was really helping me out. Um, but she was still going to the hospital every month because she was still hearing voices. And so one day she came to me and said, "Hey, I really, really need to work." And I thought, "Wow." This is fantastic. And I got out my resume paper, and she asked me, what, well, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get some res get, get a resume put together for you and get you out, get you, some, get you employed. She said, no, no, no. I need to work right now. I said, I'm not sure I understand you. She said, I'm experiencing voices, and I've noticed that when I'm in the kitchen at the cafe, I barely can hear those voices, so I need to work right now. Is there something that you can get me to do down at the cafe? We didn't have anything, but I went down there because we always had some kind of inventory work, and I put it to work. She did that for four days straight, and I put her to work. That was the first month that she missed the hospital. She had come to experience on her own accord the fact that employment and working was helping to distract her from the symptoms. And many of you, if not all of you, are familiar with the mindfulness technique, which teaches us to stay in the present, not focus on the past and some of the things that we've done or some of the things that have happened to us and not focus on the future, the things that we're worried about, the anxious thoughts that occur but to stay in the moment. That's what she learned, that employment is really a therapeutic intervention. It's a form of mindfulness. As I'm here talking to you today, I'm not thinking about the past, nor am I thinking about the future. I'm not even thinking about any problems that I might have. I'm thinking about delivering this webinar to you in the best fashion that I possibly can. She discovered that, and she avoided the hospital. A couple months into this, she continued to miss the hospital. Now, she would come to me and she would say, hey, put me to work, and I would do so. But she was missing the hospital. And I kept joking around with her because I said, you know, 
you know, you got to be making money for the things that you do. And so I'd go in the morning and get my coffee and pay for my coffee, and, and I would joke with her and say, hey, look, at you know, there's a, there's a waitress down the street that's got paid for pouring somebody a cup of coffee. And she kind of laughed and said, yeah, but I'm, I'm just not ready. And so as we've continued our relationship and journey forward, eventually she said, yes, I think I can do this. And I said to her, fantastic. And that very day, I got a call from a business person that I had been working with. It never happens that way, by the way, not that quick. And he said to me, Lynn, I've got an opening, and the last two people you sent my way, they are by far my best workers. Do you have anybody for me? And I said, absolutely. And I told him about this woman who I had permission to share her story. And so you know part of her story. But the other part of her story is this. Before me getting involved with her, she had spent, and before pro, she had spent 20 years in a day treatment program. She literally had no work experience. In addition to that, she was in jail before joining the day treatment. So she has a criminal background, she's never worked, and she has an eighth grade education. Now, people like that usually don't get jobs. However, the business person said to me, okay, I get it, but can she clean? I said, yeah, yeah, she can clean. He said, bring it up, I'd like to meet her. And I knew at that point that there was a good chance she was going to get this job because, as I said, she has a high likability quotient, which is very important when you're interviewing. And so we went up, and he walked her around the place where she would be working, which was an office park. And as he was walking her through the office park, and I was sitting in the waiting room, he interviewed her, and she got the job. Now, someone like her, as I said, doesn't usually get the job. And about a week into her job, she calls me frantically and says, wait a minute, I think I made a terrible mistake. I'm experiencing symptoms out here. I'm hearing voices. And I said to her, come in. And we talked. And I said, look, what's happening is you're in a new environment. You have a new job. You have new expectations. This is common that people experience anxiety when they first start a job. It doesn't matter whether you're disabled or not. And what it's doing for you is it's elevating your voice there. And so I'm going to ask you a very simple question. Where in your life do you not experience symptoms? Because we just need to get through the first three weeks or four weeks of this job. And she thought about it a moment, and she said, well, I guess the only place I don't experience symptoms is in church. And I said, tell me about your church experience, because it might be different than what I've experienced. And she said, well, in church, I'm singing constantly. When the pastor's not preaching, we're singing. And I said, well, I'm going to give you a couple options. Number one, I'm going to buy you a headset, and you can play your gospel music, or you can just sing. You are working in an office park. Everybody's gone home for the day. Nobody's going to be preached. And so she elected to sing. That got her through the three weeks. And I checked in with the supervisor, and the supervisor said to me, she's been a fantastic worker, great worker. Thank you for, for sending her my way. I think she's in the wrong field. I said, well, what do you mean by that? She said, well, he, she, she's got a fantastic voice. He, she needs to be singing. I said, well, that's something that we're going to work on later. But employment changed this person's life. Someone who had all those strikes against her is now working and is not experiencing the mental health system anymore. These are what employment offers, these stories. Employment offers a better way of life for people, not just because that they reduce their symptoms, which is uh, researched. They experience hospital systems far less frequently, but they also live a higher quality of life, and they are no longer trapped in a mental health system. These are some resources. Um, 
uh, from Temple uh, University, a practical guide for people with mental health conditions who want to work. Art and I efforts, we can uh, we can work uh, we can save uh, we can work for people in recovery and a provider handbook. That also includes, by the way, the um, video, and then also the employment resource book, which is. Uh, put out by the Center for Practice Innovations in Columbia University. That is a fantastic, uh, fantastic resource. So um, I think I will pause there. And Jason, I'll turn it over to you. I want to thank you all. And I'm more than uh, happy to answer some questions that you might have. So I'm hoping that you have some and you can put them in the chat box. Len, thank you so much for such a great presentation. Um, especially the link between the utilization of employment to move from the system of mental health and really have your own agency as someone that's been part of that system. Um, one of the questions that we did have that came in was, what do you say to folks who are struggling to find employment, who are motivated to find employment, but they equate it to their sense of purpose and their sense of autonomy and pride? That's a great question. And I think the first thing to recognize is that if you are experiencing mental health symptoms and have a disability, one of the most courageous things you can do is look for work. Because if you've ever been unemployed, and I've been unemployed, if you've ever been unemployed, you know that it's a job to look for work. In fact, it's not a very popular job. It's a job that you get rejected time in and time out. And so, People need constant validation during that process, regardless of whether you have a disability or not. And so I would just encourage, uh, I would show the person to continually um, to be encouraged. Even if um, you can uh, just recognize them. You know, in our post program, for example, we really made sure, because we know that looking for work is so tough, in order to keep people motivated, in order to keep people kind of hanging in there, that we would need to recognize people. So recognize people when they have said, yes, I want to work. Recognize uh, people when they have filled out an application for, for the first time. Recognize people when they get an interview. They might not have gotten the job, but they got an interview. And for some people, that's a big deal. So constantly recognizing people. And then also, share your own social capital. 70% of the general population find their work through social capital. That is through a friend or a friend of a friend or a colleague or a church member or, or someone who goes to the synagogue, but, or even a neighbor. But less than 10% of people that, with of disabilities find their employment that way. Because many times the people that they're hanging out with also have a disability and don't have that social capital. And so we all can be of great benefit to people that are going through trying to find work by sharing our social capital with them. Hopefully that answers your question. Thank you so much. That is great. Um, another question that we had uh, came in around utilizing some tools from motivational interviewing. Um, especially change talk in terms of helping others see employment as this way of moving out of the mental health system. Um, just do you have any comments on that at all? I would say absolutely. Use, use motivational interviewing. In fact, with, with the conversation that I had with that gentleman that I mentioned in the uh, pros group uh, and talking about uh, his uh, daughter, was a, 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 a motivational interview. And um, that's really a nice way to begin to help people explore uncomfortable questions. And you know what's interesting is we in the mental health field, we don't look at unemployment as a crisis for people. And if you or I or anyone in this audience was unemployed, we would be moving pretty hard to find employment we would be almost, some people would say it's just a crisis. And yet we have no, for people with disabilities, we don't treat it as a crisis. We don't see this as, my God, they're going to, you know, they're only going to be living on $808 a month or they're going to be living on less. So I think part of it is talking about how unemployment affects people and having that long conversation in a very open-ended way. I also 
also want to make mention that I am currently working um, with SAMHSA on a conversation guide that will really help people to explore employment within a therapeutic setting. I hope to have some more news about that soon. Great. Thank you. Um, another question that came in was around the struggle of helping someone to find employment when they're an undocumented citizen. Have you come up with this uh, concern, and how have you uh, puzzled through that? Again, I think that um, I, I've had that happen, not as frequently as you might think, but um, the idea of social capital, because if I'm an undocumented um, worker and I'm trying to find work, I'm not, I'm not able to go through the channels that I normally would go. Um, like people would go, uh, first thing that they would do with, uh, in today's age is, is go on a career builder site or a monster.com or indeed.com. Those are sites that are probably not going to garner much success for people. So it's really important for that person to be looking for work by exploring the use of someone's social capital, the people in their life that are probably in the helping profession at this point or other people, maybe family members that do have uh, connections that can lead, to help lead them to employment and that can help them answer questions and maybe get by a little easier. For example, I had uh, worked with um, a person in um, our, our PROS program that um, wasn't undocumented, but they, they had some uh, criminal background and for this job they just they were not able to get past that but I had developed some social capital with the management which gave me the opportunity to talk with them and to say hey um, you know this this I know he has a criminal background but I think that he would be uh, worth it to talk with him to interview with him and to eventually hire him and because I had a connection he was able to secure that job. I got to secure the interview first, and then he sold himself during the, the interview process. So the idea of social capital gives people um, a leg up and also gives people a access to the hidden job market because many, many jobs never hit those one ads. They're filled way before through, through social capital. Thank you so much. Um, and the last question that we did have was around the struggle of working with a population that is currently homeless and seeking employment. Um, a little bit on the hierarchy of needs. So how would you work through that issue? That's another good question. In fact, the, the conversation guide that I'm working with SAMHSA is um, partially in part with um, a group that works with uh, the homeless population. And um, it is really important. I know it's, sometimes you think, well, what comes first, employment or housing? Or you, know, you need employment to get decent housing? Or um, do you just find a job and then that will give you access to better housing? Um, it's really, um, when, I, when I come across that, it's, it's it's a conversation that you have with the individual. Because some individuals might say, you know what, I'm just not able to to look for employment while um, I'm trying while I'm homeless. Other people that I've worked with have said, heck, I, I need to get a job first. I mean, I'll, I'll stay in a shelter, but I need a job so that I can actually get a get get housing. So it's a conversation that you need to have with people, um, and, and each person is different. Right. That was great. Len, I, I want to personally thank you for such a great presentation, um, as well as thank the audience for joining us. Um, we are transitioning to the end of the webinar. Um, so we'd like to say that we are happy that you were able to join us. Please look out for the recording, as well as all of the materials and resources that were mentioned on our website, ctacny.org, as well as the rest of the offerings for our series on the social determinants of health. Thank you for joining us today. And Len, again, thank you for such a great presentation. Thank you, everyone. Bye.